parallel computing takes a giant problem, breaks it up into pieces to solve it concurrently. Parallel voices seek to do the same thing. But until now, we haven't been able to do this on a broad scale. Let's think about why. We have the internet now, and we all know exactly how the internet has changed all of our lives, our societies, our world so profoundly. The internet has completely redefined and restaged community. The internet has changed how we exchange information and power. There's almost nothing more profound than the internet. <laughs> oh, well, okay. So we have the Egyptian uprising over here, and we have the lolcat. The internet is the staging ground for our most vile, our most elegant, our most beautiful, our most rebellious, our most porn-tastic elements. As individuals, we, we all contain multitudes, each one of us. Each one of us is equal parts saint and hooligan. And as a collective humanity, the internet reflects back all of our multitudes for us. The internet is a cloud of multitudes. From the cerebral to the anhara chakra, the heart, to the underbelly. And I believe that what makes the internet so compelling for us as individuals is that it offers us a sideways glance from whatever solitary gauntlet we're running. Before the internet, we found sufferers and dreamers like us by accident or painstakingly one by one. And now we have a search engine, which is really at its basest element what the internet is. We can find other survivors of cancer. We can find other people training for marathons. We can find people trying to get pregnant, stay pregnant, get married, stay married, get sane, and stay sane. The internet underwrites solitary journeys, and the, the very most solitary journeys of healing and creation, creativity. And the reason why this is so compelling for all of us is because ultimately, when it comes down to it, we are completely alone. Each one of us in this room, completely alone. Only I have this skin, this perspective, these gains and losses. It's lonely. Empathy is not the same thing as understanding. It has great value to have people around you, your family, your spouse, your friends. But they can really only watch from sidelines and love and pray and hope to the best that they can. But they can't really understand because they're not in your skin. People who are in our skin, who share these solitary journeys, of creativity or grief in particular, they do understand. And they are the ones who can help us believe and have faith that what we see in our imagination, that what only we can see from inside the skin, both horrors and wonders, they help us remember that it's all worthy. So my first proper gauntlet was a horror. Beautiful and magical but perilous. Before this happened, I'd never even been stung by a bee, so it was indeed a shock. This is me at 26 weeks pregnant, which is six months pregnant, just about, with identical twin boys. I had a two-and-a-half-year-old son at home who was pretty much spinning around in circles at the thought of having two new, you know, smaller beings to dominate. And a week after this picture was taken, I went into labor, and the boys were delivered by crash C-section, which is quite literally when a room explodes and babies emerge out of it in various states. That's how it feels. So Ben was two pounds even, which is sort of the size of a couple of decks of cards. And as a mother, this is perhaps the most unnatural feeling to have to behold your child or your children with horror. You're not supposed to feel that way when you look at a baby, but the difference between this situation and the blessed usual situation is that you're not looking at a baby. You're looking at a fetus. 
an alien life form in many, many ways. Vocal cords not yet working, no sound able to come, and eyes still fused shut and skin just hanging off little bones. This is Liam, and he was two pounds, nine ounces. And this is me, the day after Liam died in my arms. We took out the ventilator, and 12 hours later, he took his last breath in what will always be, I'm quite sure, the most difficult but the most illuminating and honored, honorable evening, night of my life, certainly the longest. Ben, meanwhile, was, as the nurses called him, appropriately ticked off, which is a wonderful thing to see in the NICU. Even though he couldn't make a sound and couldn't see a thing, he wanted to go home, and I wanted to take him home too, as did my husband. And so we'd look through the portholes, and we'd say, come on, just get mad. Yeah, get mad. Grow. Let's get out of here. And so we did. And once his eyes did open, they stayed like that. And they're still like that, way up here to soak up the world. And he's a boy who eats only with the lusty joy of a kid who's born with a two-millimeter wide feeding tube. I don't know if it's just me impressing my trauma on him, but he is so delighted to be here, so happy to be here, that I just wonder if somehow there's, he's got some muscle memory that tells him that he almost wasn't. The gauntlet that followed the great solitary journey to come next for me was my escape and my wonder. When I was six, I knew exactly what I wanted to be. Mounds of curls. I would be a teenager. And better yet, a teenager with a tan. <laughs> Failing that, which I figured out would, would, would fail pretty quickly, I'd be a roller skater. And failing that, I was going to be an author. It was just always something I knew as soon as a story would unfold itself to me. And when you're six and you make the declaration that you're going to be an author, the very best parents in the world that you can have look most earnestly back at you and say, well, of course you are and they're not being patronizing. They believe it just as much as you do. So my very worst, my horror, and my very best, my wonder, those two gauntlets intertwined with parallelism all around. The first story that I ever told was the story of being Liam's mother. This phantom motherhood, this letting go, for the year after he died, it was like an open window through which all of the natural world was talking to me and whispering to me, trees and rocks and the ocean just always whispering at me and saying, we have him, we have him. I'd hear his teenage voice saying, mom. I'd hear his 60-year-old voice saying, I couldn't stay. And I heard his six-year-old voice saying, I'm busy. It was magic, and I felt like a sorcerer. I felt like I could conjure it. And then the window slammed shut, and it felt like drudgery, like I just had to continue on without one of my three sons. And so I wrote all the way through this publicly and got great support that way. But the magical thing that happened, or two magical things, the first thing that I did, because I knew from my own experience that Nobody knows how to grieve. Everybody feels terribly lost in grief, terribly isolated. And so I founded Glow in the Woods, which is a community for bereaved parents. And hundreds of thousands of mothers and fathers have been there. It's a hotbed of parallelism. And but I got to a point in that first year where I needed some fresh air. I needed some good, clean dirt. I needed to remember who I was and who I wanted to be. And that's when a hand yanked me, a grimy one, and pulled me into that fresh air, and it was a pirate. And with that crew saying, you work for us now, I manufactured in my imagination all of the multitudes that I needed, quiet, noise, orders. I needed my orders. 
I needed brawn. I needed kindness. I needed a tender hand with explosives. And I needed pride, and so I invented it. A week after I finished that first story, I got an email that changed my life and brought that dream to fruition. It was uncanny. A woman who was an editor with a publishing house had found my blog and had read about Liam, and she said, I'm sorry about Liam, but if you ever have a book in you, will you let me know? The week after I'd finished my first book, my first story. And so I said, yeah, but it's just a silly thing for kids. And she said, I'm in charge of silly things for kids. So send it through. And so I did. And that box of hardcovers, when it came in, I sniffed it for a week. It's kind of pervy, actually. <laughs> so that's my first novel. And the sequel is on the way. And I still can't believe it, that I'm an author. Maurice Sendak calls creative people isolationists. And he says, what a transcendent life. I'm a lucky man. Because he chose isolation as a creative person. Some of us don't choose isolation. We have it thrust upon us by trauma. But I think that it can be transcendent either way. I think that we may as well work devotedly inside of that isolation. I felt strange writing a book. And I felt strange as a grieving mother, flailing with story in both cases, flailing to shepherd a story and flailing to fight a story. I didn't want to carry that story of being a bereaved mother. Parallel voices, so other writers, other creative people, musicians, artists, as well as other grieving people, were the ones who could look at me and say, yeah, that's normal. And then calm, because as soon as you learn that the flailing is normal and that nobody particularly likes flailing, you kind of stop flailing. As soon as you realize the strangeness is the baseline, you can actually get to work. That work involves playing with those images in your imagination. And you can't do that without a communion of understanding people who give you the space to do that. I used to burn toast or stub my toe, and I would be assaulted with the image of Liam's body in my lap. I was sitting cross-legged on the hospital bed, and after he had taken his last breath, I, we looked at him for a while. And if you've ever been with someone when they die, when that spirit's gone, the body is totally slack in a way that's, well, it's extraordinary because it makes you think about spirit and what happens. And so to explain that assault, of that image, which became very violent in my mind. People who loved me would say, stop that, don't do that, no, 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 just stop torturing yourself. Of course, I couldn't help it, but people who understood would say, well, first of all, they would hear me out, and they would nod, and they would look at me and say, yes, yeah, I, ha I have that too. Parallel voices receive that kind of guts and bone and marrow of what you've been through and make it okay to bear. Dr. Seuss, we all know that who this is. This is the face of the artist and I think also the face of the bereaved struggling with those stories that they have to carry. Sherry Fitch, the beloved Sherry Fitch, who is my Glinda the Good Witch of children's literature in Canada, she said to me once, I don't know how to write. <laughs> Yes, you do. You've written, I don't even know, 30, 35 novels. If she eats something different for breakfast, the Globe and Mail review section reports on it, pretty much, at least from my perspective. And she said, no, every time I sit down with a new idea, I'm, 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 I'm a beginner all over again. I don't know how to do this. I really don't. Which is kind of the secret that nobody tells you, unless you have people like that to tell you. This is Sidney Smith, who brought the Dread Crew to life, the illustrator. He believes most fervently that he is a fraud. Just look at what he's done. Have a look at that and imagine Sydney in front of you eating a sandwich and saying, I have no idea how to draw. I really suck at this. And he did that. I was sitting there and he, he was insisting to me that he sucked. 
And I said, no, no, you don't suck, I suck. And we had this ridiculous argument. And when you, when you have that moment with another parallel person running the same gauntlet as you are, chosen or not, you realize this wonderful revelation that nobody knows how. Everybody feels like a fraud. Everybody is alone and desperately lonely with being alone. And so we may as well be lonely together and make it all right. So your parallel voices, they may still be scattered, unorganized, but they're out there. Stories of survival and survivors of creativity, of grief, of ambition, of change. So you have a search engine. Find them. Thank you. <laughs>